evening, good evening, good evening, family. Good evening, good evening. My name is Aaliyah Berry. Welcome to Sidewalk Talk. We are on our second episode of season two, coming to Netflix, HBO, all your platforms streaming soon enough, family. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So Sidewalk Talk is an online platform where we have real talk about the streets of Newark, New Jersey to gain insight clarify misconceptions, and get a call to action from those who know best, right? So we gain insight by having nuanced conversations and unpacking truths that really are not often being discussed. We look to clarify misconceptions about groups of people who are often unheard or misunderstood based on assumptions about their lives. And then who knows best about the call to action, right? Well, who knows best is those who are on the front lines here in Newark, New Jersey, those who are in boots on the ground, serving, knowing what needs to be done, right? So we try to lift up the work of local organizations and get a call to action from these frontline workers, okay? We want our marching orders because at the end of the day, talk is cheap. Right. And so no offense to meetings or emails, family, but it's time to it's time to move. It's time to move. Right. It's time for action. And so we're here to get our marching orders regarding a variety of different topics. So, again, I am your host, Aaliyah Berry. Um, For some of you who may not know me, like, let me uh, take this opportunity to introduce myself. So I'm a licensed clinician. I have 20 years experience working with ages zero to 60 years old in a variety of settings. So I've been in daycares, after school programs, summer camps, schools, correctional facilities, shelters, group homes, a whole bunch of different places working with a variety of different kinds of people. I'm a community-based social worker. And so what that means to me, like community-based, is this like life, this work here, right, is a lifestyle. It often happens outside the four walls of an agency. It often happens outside the hours of nine to five, right? And so for community-based social work, to me, that means that I find myself in baby showers and graduations, unfortunately, at sentencing hearings or funerals, goal setting on the sidewalk and getting hugs at a red light. So that's kind of some of my lens and where I'm coming from. I currently work as a consultant with seeds and berries, um, doing program development, training, and direct clinical services in schools, nonprofits, and the government sector. So you can t- keep in touch with me on Facebook and Instagram um, at seeds and berries, and also on LinkedIn, Aaliyah Berry, and on my website at seedsandberries.com. We also have a whole season one worth of 10 episodes. So this episode, if you missed it live, you can also catch it on the YouTube channel um, at Seeds and Berries and also the first 10 episodes, um, even our premiere episode of season two, where we have a lot of dynamic guests and talked about a lot of different powerful topics. So definitely like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, and, you know, kind of lean in to uh, what we have in terms of content. So a little bit of housekeeping um, before I bring on the guests. So number one is to like this broadcast, to like, to love, to laugh, right? To, to show those emotions with this broadcast because it helps my guests and I um, know that we're not in a room by ourselves, <laughs> right? So you're able to react to the content and engage in that way. Also, if you are listening and you find that there's someone who would be interested in this conversation, then you're also able to tag them in the comments and then they'll get a notification and can join us, right? Um, and so then last is to comment right? To comment in the comment section. Again, that's good for engagement. You can ask questions. You can add your own experience and expertise into the comments so that we do have a more uh, dynamic, you know, conversation with you all, even if it's virtual. And then please do share for impact right? Share for impact. We're not sharing for popularity. We're sharing because my guests and I um, feel that we do have an important message, right? Um, and so we want it to be able to go near and far to those who um, who would benefit from it. So that is my housekeeping to like, tag, and share for impact, as well as comment in the comment section. 
All right. So um, tonight's topic. So how I kind of do sidewalk talk and how I do topics. Right. I think about the topic itself as to what I think the community needs in this time. Right. And then I go through my mental Rolodex and I figure out who is the expert on this particular topic. Well, last Sidewalk Talk episode, we talked about integrating adults back into the workplace and making sure that their mental health is strong and how to support them and, you know, that kind of thing. Well, we start with adults in the workplace, but then we can't move on until we address our young people who are also returning to their workplace, which is schools, right? So the topic today is from sidewalk to the school, supporting our children in the new normal. Now, keywords normal, we're going to discuss a lot today, what that is, uh, why it is, should we be returning to whatever that was, we're going to talk in depth about that keyword in tonight's topic. Um, but when it comes to from the sidewalk to the school, supporting our young people, knowing what our young people are often thinking or how they are looking at things is Mr. Thomas Owens. Drum roll, drum roll, drum roll. Mr. Thomas Owens is the executive director of Mentor Nork, and he is, has uh, decades of experience, right? So his wisdom has definitely been marinating for quite some time and has experience from macro level systems, organizations, building capacity of organizations, schools, macro level experience, as well as micro level experience on the ground, in the trenches, in the classrooms, right? On the sidewalk. And so he kind of knows everything in between. Um, and so if he doesn't necessarily know how young people are looking at things, he also has a uh, relationship building authenticity enough to ask them, <laughs> right? Which is what we should be doing anyway, right, family? We should be asking our young people how they're looking at things and what their perspectives are um, so that we can best support them. So when I came up with this topic tonight, um, Thomas Owens is the perfect, perfect expert topic, uh, I mean, guest to lead us on this topic. So I'm super excited to get this started. Again, like, tag, and share for impact um, and comment as you see fit as we move forward in the interview. Hello, great. hello. Good evening, Mr. Thomas hey, Owens. how are you? I'm good. good. To see you. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good today. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to sit down and talk with you um, on this critical topic. And in this season, uh, we are definitely in a unique season in life. <laughs> so, um, so I guess I, I introduced from my heart, I introduced you. However, mm -hmm. let's go into a little formal introduction um, to introduce yourself to the audience. Okay, uh, once, again, once again, my name is Thomas Owens. I'm the executive director of Mentor Newark here in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, prior to that, I was one of the founders of the Eagle Academy for Young Men of Newark. Um, real simply, my life has been about building the capacity and working with young people and, and trying to be a, a good steward and a good guard and kind of, as we always say, put them in good light, make sure they have everything they need to grow, and then to be witness to their incredible growth. Um, as, I, as I told you before, the best lessons I've learned about how to work with young people, I've learned from young people. And if you spend enough time with them, they'll show you just what they want. More than that, they'll show you what they expect from adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Which, so, and let me just ask this. I, you know, a big part of that is, it, would you agree, is humility to be able to yeah. even hear them uh, and put yourself to the side enough to be able to hear what they need from us. Yeah, to hear what they've got to say, but then also to walk into a room, <clears throat> not with the attitude that we know it all. Because you know, once again, kids aren't blind, they're not deaf. So they look at the community and look at the schools and they see the things, some of the great things, but they also they see the challenges and the problems that we have in our community and understand that, you know, for adults, that was your purpose. That was your task to make sure these things didn't exist. Simply the fact that they do exist means you're not perfect. So please don't present yourself as perfect to a young person when they walk over and they see it. Mm -hmm. And they know you guys aren't perfect. And they don't hold anything against you for not being perfect. 
they hold something against you for acting like you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And I know we're going to get into more detail mm-hmm. kind of about that and applying yeah. that principle to this topic here tonight. So before we get into kind of the impact of COVID um, mm-hmm. this and the situation in schools right now and getting a call to action, right? Like that's where we're headed. But to mm-hmm. kind of lay some foundation on this episode, let's begin kind of from a 90,000 foot view, right? Okay. Um, just to talk about like the view, like the relationship between young people and adults, just period, from the 90,000 foot view before we even get into the micro levels. Like help us understand the dynamic between young people and adults in general, both past and present. Like where has it been and how did we get here? I've always felt that the relationship is complicated at best um, because a lot of times we want young people or we challenge young people to be stuff that we aren't. You know, and I always say the first thing that adults can do to make to to, 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 to create better situations for young people is to be a better adult. You know, because they're looking at you as the role model. So if they look at the role model and the role model is flawed and doesn't care and it's kind of you know petty and all the other things that we can be sometimes. What they do then is they try to make it up themselves. When they make it up themselves, you got to remember they're 12, 13, 14 without the experience you have. So like I, one thing I would encourage the people I work with all the time. They would give the story about I'm logic. I like logic. The story they would give when I was young, these kids are so bad. And when I was young, we didn't do that. And we had family, and we did this, and we did that. And then the question to the adult is, okay, so whose responsibility was it to maintain those structures? It, it couldn't have been the kids' responsibility. So it's your responsibility. So that's almost like I used to see this in schools. That's almost like a teacher who sees the principal coming down the hall. Look at this class. Look at these kids. Look at the way they're acting in the class. You're showing me your deficiency because that's your class. So for me, you call me down the hall and say, come in and fix this. Don't you get paid to do that? So sometimes, you know, we, we look at young people without taking the responsibility that, you know, we have to be there for. Like I, I had a student of mine who, every time you see him, every time we have an event, he would be taking, uh, he would take fruit, he would take candy, any kind of food he would get. He fill up bags of the stuff, you know, and take it home. And we asked him. I finally, I gave him a ride home one day, and I asked him why he did that. He said, "Because when I get home, I'm not guaranteed that mom's gonna have dinner on the table, so I've got to do what I can do, whether it's candy, whatever." So what we began to look at, one principal told me, is that most of the problems that you see with adults, you can track back to an adult not doing their job. And most of the times, young people. And I'm not saying it's going to be perfect if you do everything, but it'll be a lot better than it is. Mm -hmm. So I think the relationship, number one, is we've got to stop looking at them without looking at ourselves. And kind of, I love going to to speak engagements with uh, Susan Taylor from Essex. And now it's the, uh, what she says all the time, whenever she speaks to young people, her first word out of her mouth, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We should have prepared this better for you. We should have lined this up better. And now let's work together to try to find solutions to some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was awful. My mm-hmm. bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So real, yeah. real quick, in the comments, mm-hmm. somebody is commenting that there is some, um, some feedback. So I just, mm-hmm. and I want to fix it in mm-hmm. now. So they mm-hmm. said that the mic is picking up the head, the, your headphones. So maybe take the headphones off. And that's my apologies, everyone. <laughs> but we don't want to continue the whole episode. Um, and then, uh, how was that? That's better. And let's let's we'll we'll continue. But then um, this viewer will let us know in the comments because I don't want to. Yeah, let us know if that's better. I took the headphones off. Okay. I was hearing a little bit something also. Okay. It, I think, yeah. And, and it did sound fine to me, but this is exactly why we want to be able to do this. Yeah. And there's no, we're not CNN. So there's, there's no shame about it. No, I just don't want the whole hour to, to not be what we expect. So let me know. You know, tell us yeah. Know, a, yeah. A change. I took the headphones off and moved to the other side. So, okay. So, yeah. So, um, if that viewer can give us, um, some feedback, but we're going to continue. So, um, just a piece about, you know, um, you know, one kind of negative affirmations, right. Mm -hmm. That I heard you say, and, um, just about like, and I've said this up until last week recently, just like sometimes as a community, we, we find that like, it's like cute 
to call kids bad. So as soon as you say, oh, he's bad, right? She's bad. Like that is something that we we often have to discuss as community because sometimes it's like, oh, he, 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 right? Oh, he's, my son is so bad. Like he's just, he keeps his, right? But then we're working with the son all grown up who has been convinced by some of these negative affirmations, which we could say a whole lot of more negative affirmations. Um, but then to your point, when those neg- negative affirmations manifest, then for the adults to blame kids for the shortcomings. So how, That's like, true. give some more examples about that. Because yes, I see that in schools a lot. We see that in a lot of places. Like, can you give us some more examples of that? I think that it's for us to be... This is an opportunity, particularly with uh, with COVID and all the stuff we've gone through. This is a perfect opportunity for us to begin to kind of re-examine ourselves and look at how we talk, what language we use, how do we move, what do we say to each other? You know, because one of the things we always say is therefore. Like, I, there's a great writer out of, uh, a professor out of D.C., Ivory Tolson, who's now at Howard University. He wrote a whole book on this stuff. And he talks about that when, he, when, he, um, when people talk to young people, they said, I'm, I'm sick, sick of them. I don't, I don't like, like what they, they do. do. And he, he asked, asked them, them why? Well, what is it about them that bothers you? And they, they said, well, first thing, the music they listen to and all that hip hop, hip hop, hip hop. And then he said, but didn't your generation create that? Didn't you hand it over to them as this is our gift? This is our gift. So didn't you do that? Yeah, but that's not the point. Well, you know, they're they're in gangs and all this stuff. Yeah, but aren't y'all the OGs? Aren't y'all the ones that taught them this and gave them the books and gave them the letters and learned how to do that stuff? So, so it's, it's like, like all the stuff, stuff that we, like, like we, we, all, all the stuff, stuff that we did, we put them on our lap when they were three, four, five years old and had them watch the Society, society and movies like that. that. And they're like, well, that's a classic. classic. You know, yeah. then they grow up and, and embrace that, that kind of lifestyle. And, and we, we say, say when we get a little older and we come out in clubs a little bit and we're going and now we're in the church and working about our life, all of a sudden we now, these kids are horrible. Those kids are you. Those kids are using the seeds you planted. So if you want to turn it around, go back in there and reinvest those young people. And maybe, maybe apologize, apologize for some, for some of those seeds you plant. Mm-hmm. But we don't want to, you know, often we don't want to do that as adults. We want to just make them perfect. You guys just got to stop, you know, and in many cases, we never stop. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, and if I'm not saying, you know, my thing is always my opinion. And, but sometimes some of the things that really, some comical, that will at one point say, you shouldn't embrace that lifestyle. And you can see a parent almost in mid sense, you know, an adult talking to a child. You know, we should do, we should do better. And we should love each other. And we should, oh, I got to go powers on. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> well, now we're going to watch the show that has all the things you told the kids not to do. Convict us, Thomas. I can't miss The kids are I thought that wasn't what we supposed to do. Mm. You know, but no, 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 no it's just, 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 just a movie. Mm. Come on. Mm. You know, we, we got to do better. And I'm not being a power of 50, none of that stuff. You know, I don't, that's not my cup of tea. But I'm saying that we have to look at what is the message we're sending people. And then I get the response before, before people hit me with it now. All the Italians did do that with their mafia movies and all the other. I thought we didn't want to be the white. I thought we were cool being ourselves. So therefore, our rules are and the way we run our lives should be based on us, not on based on a bunch of other people. So that's not a good excuse. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so I think that for me, it's always about, and I heard the mayor say this one, and it really, it really resounded with me, that the level of sophistication that we use to go about this life has got to, we got to raise the level. We can't always just move like we're 10. You know, and that's not a criticism. That's just saying, look, there's some, there's some different levels to this onion that we need to unwrap. Mm-hmm. Do we, I just wonder, right? Because again, I find you to be the expert on the layers of the onion, right? And so sometimes it does take like an external understanding, not only observation, right? Because like I find like what we've done so far in this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Is like exploring and assessing the onion itself, right? The layers of the onion, the impact that the lack of, assessment can have on our young people and therefore generations to come. But it's like, I wonder if we really understand the layers ourselves as adults. And if we don't, are there enough 
people who do and are speaking on it. Because like we see stuff in the grocery store all the time. Right. You see stuff on the bus. You see stuff in a, in a staff meeting while talking to, a, you know, or in schools. I mean, we see these layers that you're talking about. Are we speaking on it for those of us who do understand mm-hmm. and speaking on it in a truth that, like you said, you said, I'm not beating up on anyone, but some of this stuff still needs to be said. So I just wonder yeah. if we have enough mouthpieces that understand the layers of the onion. I think it's mouthpieces. It's a lot of people out there that get it. But also, to me, another level is the level of courage that it yeah. takes to speak up to this stuff. And to have people call you a hater and call you all the names you're going to call, for you to kind of walk through that, like, you know, I don't care. I don't care. There's a line, a uh, quote that I saw earlier this year that I kind of, I embraced. And it said that I'm not going to shrink myself to make, to, be, to make myself more digestible to you. You could choke. You know, or take, or take smaller, smaller bites, bites, but I'm not going to do it. And I, I think, think the more people that they kind of embrace the attitude, attitude that listen, you know, I'm if even if the attitude is love, that's that's, that's, that's that I love. love. I watched Greg, Greg Porter at NJ Pack on Saturday. Saturday. He's got a, a Friday. He's got a song that is called it's called No Love Dying Here. And if anybody ever wants to listen to listen to that song called No Love Dying Here, and what's so cool about this song, it talks about the fact that one of the lines is. With the, the death, death of, of love, love everywhere, everywhere. but I, I won't let it be. There, 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 there will be no love dying here for me. So no, what's cool no, about no, that is that personal no, commitment no, to say, no matter no, what's no, going on, no, I'm gonna love. No, I'm gonna no, be no, that no, person no, regardless. You know what I'm no, saying? No, I'm just no, gonna no, be. No, I'm gonna be. You know, there's even parts in the Bible where it talks about I'm a prison of love. That my it just has has to be that. And even my my mother-in-law was one of my great heroes in my life. She, she, she challenged me when I first began to, 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 to do the work I'm doing now, work in organizations and build stuff. She, I, she said, sometimes when you get to the point, and I just told somebody this, when you lose the plot, you don't really get it, and you get involved in the politics and all this stuff, and you get confused. And she said, when you get to that point in your life, she said, when in doubt, love the people. So ask yourself, what you're moving, how you're moving, is any of this involved loving the folks? And if it's not, you're in the wrong place. Absolutely. So, so how many of us can be consistent and say, I say, I say this stuff not out of trying to beat anybody up and all that nonsense. We, we say, say this stuff out of love. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. love, at the end of the day, can override a lot of these foolishness. Mm-hmm. You know, because love will allow you, if you're in a school environment and young people are in a school and the lunch is horrible, and you know, I'm just saying, some spots, you know, if lunch is bad, <laughs> love should say, my kids shouldn't eat that. Love should say they should come inside when it's raining. You know, that's, that's beyond, beyond all the rules and regulations, regulations, all that's lovely and all that's great, but none of that stuff predates love. I want them to be educated. I want them to learn. I want them to live. I want them to do better. I want them to grow. I want them to earn. I want them to, all that because I love them, not simply because it's my job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that two things just to kind of lift up is one, mm-hmm. when we talk about the courage and where to find yeah. courage in whatever Mm -hmm. assignment is in front of you, love is where you find the courage, right? Like I love Love, the community, the people, our babies, whatever the task is in front of me, I have to love it enough to put pride to the side, to put fear to the side, to put insecurity to the side. And in this case, for this episode, right, to make it relevant to this topic, our babies deserve that. Our babies deserve for you to put your fear to the side, right? Our babies deserve yeah, that. For you. Yes. They're waiting. Yes. I think yes. My, one of my, my, my things is that the young people are waiting for us to be the adults they expect so they can be the kids that we want them to be. They're just waiting for us to have, waiting for it to happen. And the way that shift happens is not just in, you know, our marches and our talk and all that great, but also in, in the language and in the words you use. Like I, you and I had this conversation last week. And we, we talked, talked about, about something, something like, like um, Tulsa, Tulsa. Mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really history, history buff, buff and I also love our culture. And I know who we are as black people. people. And, and people, people say Tulsa, it really, really gets me mad when Tulsa becomes, becomes a conversation about a riot, right? right? So, so we ask him, what is Tulsa? Well, Tulsa was just these, one of these communities, it was a black community and they owned all these businesses. And then within three minutes, and then the white folks came and they destroyed all the cities of all. 
that, that, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a piecemeal, piecemeal narrative, narrative from a different, from a different not from a spot, spot I want to live, live with. with. Because, because what, the, the question I'm asking is, that, if they had all these businesses and all this stuff was going on, and to the point that other folks were jealous, how did black folks recently out of slavery, not a lot of money, not a lot of education, how they build it in the first place? That's, that's the, the miracle. miracle. That's, that's the story. That's the story. And even the story, even beyond that, for the, the great documentary on PBS, they want to check it out. Mm-hmm. Once it was over, they rebuilt it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But all I hear about is these people tearing it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the truth, yeah. But the whole story, my strength, you know, our strength is a bigger narrative than their depravity. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, yeah. Oh, cool. I know. Yeah. I'm not like, no, but we are going to circle back and I because I yeah. want to circle back um, mm-hmm. to just the the piecemeal narratives, the, um, yeah. you know, oppressive on purpose narratives mm-hmm. <laughs> through media, through schools. I mean, we're going to kind of circle back to that because mm-hmm. in the light of the pandemic and young people walking back into the school. Yeah. That is something to kind of highlight. So before we even get into them walking back in the school, like dynamic wise, and I'm going to kind of, mm-hmm. you know, I've already heard you say, you know, mi- a lot of mixed messages, like mixed messages is like the, the theme of the dynamic, which is you're doing one thing, but you're saying another, you're blaming yeah. me for the things you put in me to begin with, right? Like this is a confusing dynamic between young yeah. people and adults and it started in the past and it has continued up to present. So that's where we are. So when it comes to the pandemic, right? April, 2020, mm-hmm. um, I found that in April, and I'm sure you did too. And a lot of our street colleagues found that young people in April, 2020 were not going back in the house. Yeah. And all the adults were, but a lot of us that worked with young people, um, young adults, teenagers, 13 year olds, 16 year olds, 24 year olds, right? I'm not going back in the house, right? COVID is fake. The homies ain't dying, so it's fake, right? Y'all are overreacting as usual. You're talking about I could bring it home to my grandmother, but I can't see it, so you must be lying. So now you're sharing your mild with the homie (laughs) during COVID. Like some of us made live videos to try to get out to the streets of young people. We were calling leaders, right, on the sidewalk, like, hey, Right. And we were pouring into leaders to try to get the rest of them like to go in the house. Like it was kind of it was a crisis in April. Um, But what it revealed to me was the fact that they didn't believe us that this was a symptom of this dynamic. Yeah, they didn't believe us. One, they didn't believe us and the truth that we were now telling them to keep them safe. They also didn't believe that our interest was to keep them safe. So it was a very telling gap that happened in April. And if you didn't talk to young people, you wouldn't see that gap. You would think they would be, they were being bad and they were being rebellious and all oh, these kids don't listen, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Let's, let's look inward. Would it speak yeah. on that? Especially yeah, as they return to schools now. That goes back to our relationship with our young people and our children and schools and all other things that we and all, and all the bill of goods that we've sold them for years, you know, and um, when I saw that happening, um, the first thing that hit me was this, this is this a, it's a level of, I just don't believe, you, you know, and that's some healing we have to do as a family and as a community that as adults, you know, I saw this once and it's not a, it's just kind of, once again, the people that teach you this stuff for kids, you know, and I remember, I remember one, one time, time in school, we did a thing the first, the first day of school. So we brought a bunch of guys into the school. You know, it was one of those moments when all the guys come to the school and they cheer the kids on and they clap and blah, 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 blah. And I thought it was going great from an adult. You know, we had all just every five men in the school and they're chanting and cheering and yelling and screaming. And I walked over to one of my guys and I'm like, oh, look at this. Is this powerful? In this powerful, I'm feeling it, right? He's like, oh, the stones. I'm not, I'm not really feeling this. this. He says, why? I'm like, why? Can't you? You don't understand. These guys you must not understand. This dude stepped back and started pointing. He sells drugs. He and alcohol. He, 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 he run the spot. He beat his wife. He cheated. And started running these cats out who's in the room. 
Wow. And he said, beyond the fact that these cats are now in my building, that's supposed to be my safe spot. <laughs> right. I'm right. suspect to you because you bought it. Dang. And kind of walked away. And I was like, wow. What did I just do? Right. So maybe it would have been a, a better idea for me to walk up to these young people and say, first day of school, what would you like to see? Mm-hmm. You know, rather, rather than thinking, thinking, thinking in my adult mind, man, we get all these dudes in the building, it's, it's going to be powerful. Mm-hmm. Not, thinking Not thinking that, that we might have just triggered a bunch of kids. Mm-hmm. That, that might, might be this guy's dad, dad that he has never seen. Mm-hmm. And now he's, he's in the, the building cheering. cheering. And this, this kid's kid now even more broken heart because she's looking at her dad who she, who never comes to see her. But is in there. You brought him there. You aggravated my pain. So that's the kind of stuff we do sometimes really well intentionally. Mm-hmm. But not well, you know, not well thought out because we never took the time, took time to really ask them, you know, what do you feel? And what, what's, how's it sound to you? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think when I looked at the pandemic, that was just another one of those incidents when I don't trust you. You know, then, then of course, young people listen to adults. And so when you say, well, the vaccine, this is fake and that fake, adults, they hear adults say this. You know, and not even that, not even, in a, in, like you said, in the micro. They're hearing adults, adults in their house say this, but then you got them in the house in front of the TV where all they do is argue and bicker. Mm-hmm. Remember, that was, a, that was at the height. What happened at the same time was the height of the anti Trump and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. The kids, when they were in the house watching TV, they're watching all this badness going. Adults are fighting, adults are disagreeing, they're taking over the cap. So, if all this stuff is going on, and you're telling me as a kid, trust the adults. And the adults are crazy. Mm-hmm. Or perceive, you know, some, some of the things, things I'm looking at. So, so that's, that's why, it, to me, it's that, that we have to give this hyper version of love and, and being and there and taking care, care. Because eventually that's, that's the stuff they trust. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like I, I told, told you about the young, young man, man I spoke earlier. earlier. If his mother, at that point, and maybe we need to help her with some food and help her with some understanding and mentoring and that kind of thing. But if it got to the point that he came home every day, there was food in the table, he wouldn't steal the food. Because now he's not, now that's not my concern that I got to feed myself at 12. Right? So a lot of this stuff is, it's, it's a big, big, big discussion. But it's also, it's time, it's family building. So I'm like, I'm like maybe, and this, this stuff, you like, it gets people in trouble. So maybe some of the time we spend on Monday evenings and Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings would be better spent sitting down talking to each other. Mm-hmm. Yes, and so <laughs> yes, that, yes, right we there. are gonna yeah. let we yes. So I mean, because to your point, though, are there already um, established spaces, yeah. right? That that should be and that were theoretically yeah. dedicated to family building, yeah. and depending on the space that we're in, and and to be clear, we're talking about faith spaces, right? Yeah. Like. That is, that was, and should be a, a ground for cultivating family building. And so not to say all of them are, but if you're in a space that is not doing that, then we may need to find one. Maybe <laughs> because, because, because spaces, yeah. As you ride through yeah. our community, particularly, there's thousands of those spaces. Well, yes. And so we did a sidewalk talk episode on yes, the specifically for for my lens, the church in the community. We're not going to go there, but the yes, we we definitely have addressed that because every faith space needs to look inward, which a lot of this conversation today is going to is talking is is talking and is going to talk more on looking inward. So do faith spaces that are designated to family building need to look inward? 100%. So when we talk about then returning back to the school, right, um, and them kind of walking back in, that whole piece about, you know, we think that, like, what we're doing is so powerful, dynamic, fly, lit, right? And, like, this is going to be so awesome. And then you do talk to a young person, and they're like, yeah, you talked at me for two and a half hours. Right. Like you lectured me all afternoon. You, you know, the, the, the situation that you described, um, a lot of that lecture stuff, too, needs to go out the window. But that's sidebar. Um, but a lot of times we don't ask them and they are not centered. Not only they are not centered in the experience, because even the experiences that are designed to serve them, 
we're centering us in the experience that's designed to serve them. And they are not centered in the planning phases. So, you know, I am, you know, shout out to Opportunity Youth Network, right? Robert Clark, OYN taught me that young people belong in the planning spaces. So they used to interview staff, they would be pulled into all adult meetings, right? What does that look like when we're talking about redefining normal? Right. And that's like the buzzword, the hot word. Right. Like redefining normal. Thomas, these kids are going back. They already went back into these schools. What should be on our radar as school staff and school leaders? Let's just kind of talk about that before we go out to the sidewalk. The people in the building, what needs to be on their radar and how do we center young people in that planning and building? First thing, you know, the first thing I always, I start with, is I just say a prayer for the people, the superintendent, the teachers, the principals who do this work, because I, you know, speaking to them, they're incredible, and the work they're doing, I wouldn't wish on anybody. It's some of the most difficult work we've ever done in our lives. Facts. So, you know, whenever you see a teacher or a principal or whatever, you know, give them a pat on the back and say, you know, say a prayer for them because they need it. But the other part about it is where I saw some, Some of the, the challenges, challenges is like, like um, and, and this just, just kind of makes sense to me. Someone, someone asked, asked me about my organization, organization and they said, and, um, how, how do you pivot? pivot? And, and I, I think, think a lot, lot of times we describe as the district has, this is how we pivot. pivot. But I, I think, think there's, there's a moment you got to prepare to pivot. Because when you prepare to pivot, that's the pre-work to get done before you can pivot. Like we always say the saying, you know, all the time, you know, if, if, if God, God if, they, if they, they close, the devil close the door, door God, God can open a window. window. And I, I ask people, when was the last time, time you climbed out of a window? window? You might you not be able to do that. that. Might be too high. high. You know, so, 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 so we looked at, when I looked at young people, people is to look, look at, at number one, one when, when they, they came back in the building, the crush was a young person in a forum like this. I heard a young lady, a young lady say, 11th grader, I can't, I'm looking forward to getting back to school because I feel like I have a clean sleep. And, and everything is beginning again, and I can get at it. And then, so if that young person is met with an adult that's saying, I can't wait to get back to normal, that's a clash. That's a culture clash beyond all the work. Because if this young person is now looking for, we now can, we now have the unique opportunity to redesign what my school experience looks like. And we can include some hybrid, hybrid stuff. We can do some stuff online because we have, we've built those networks over the last two years. So we're doing, we can, we can do this and we can do that. And they, they walk, walk back into the class and they're like, like okay, we're going right back to 2019. And I think what we can do, what we, one thing we can try to do as a group and as adults is to talk to them and maybe to reinvent, reinvigorate and, and re-inspire this experience that we call school. And, but to do that, we have to be able to say that the experience that we call school, the way it was, is gone. That's, that's the hardest the thing, thing for us to say because that's, that's tied to contracts and deals and, and, and money and, and all the other things that adult stuff. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that weighs it down a little bit. But how can we look at school and say, listen, let's take this opportunity to recreate this experience for our young people. So they have moved. And when they come back in the building, when they were expecting this to be a rehab effort, it now becomes a redesign. And that's 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 something that's exciting to young people. How do we do that? You know, and that's I think those are some of the questions. That, that we should, should ask, ask as, as educators, as parents, you know, you know what's, what's different, different besides what is already different? different. You know, what, what can, can we change? change? And what, what ways can we get young, young people involved that they now embrace this school environment, environment and they, they feel like, like, wow, this is a shift, right? right? So, so that to me is the biggest question. question. How do we redesign, recreate, but also at the same time, make sure young people are getting educated? So that to me is beyond, let's get, I don't, I don't even embrace you know, you know, as I told you before, my, my, you know, if I had up to me, I'd have a T-shirt, you know, keep it, keep it G. I'd have a keep it G-rated. I would have a T-shirt that said F normal. Right. Right. That's almost how we got it. Right. Right. So why do we, why would we want to go back to normal? Facts. And that's what the, right. And that's what you're saying. That's what the young people are walking back in with is I don't want They're your normal. The spirit. Many of them, like some. Everyone's, Everyone's not, not the same. same. Of course. Many of them walk in with a spirit like, yeah, I'm young, let's recreate, let's do this. So they're pushing against you saying, let's just start where we left off. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm going to start where I left off. I lost 10 uncles and a aunt. Mm-hmm. I said, I mean, I didn't shift it. I looked at it on computer. I didn't have a computer when this thing started. I have one now. I didn't know how to do it. And this for adults often. You know, how many adults right now didn't do, have never done a video meeting in their life until this? So you're telling me now in a, in a, in a market where you now have 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 million people that didn't do this before now do this and it's the same? It can't be the same. Right. The landscape has totally shifted. Right. So, you know, why would we try to look at it being something that we, you know, it's not going to work like that. So that's to me, that's the long answer to a short question is we have to look at how we can use this opportunity to shift and to, and to, and to move our young people to the next level of education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then, so, and as you were talking, and this is, I feel like the most, you know, the the biggest answer in this whole episode, just about mm-hmm. like leaving the old normal behind. Um, yeah. And so while you were talking, right, I tried to like put myself in school staff's shoes, right? Yeah. And to hear the, I can't wait to get back to normal, Thomas, right? And these kids are coming in like, it's an awesome time to like redesign, reevaluate, like get all this new stuff off the ground. I hear the adult saying, um, that's terrifying, yeah. right? That's terrifying. And that's a lot of work. That's a lot of hard work. Um, but then you followed up with the, look what you've just accomplished the whole last school year. Y'all got it. <laughs> Y'all got it. Like y'all did design a new normal and it was extremely heavy. Yeah. 500,000 people dead, died. Wasn't wasn't, wasn't terrifying. Right. Right. The fact that you could walk outside of the grocery store and possibly die wasn't terrifying. Right. Right. So you've been terrified. Right. And had to, right. And had to redesign school. Yeah. In the midst of a totally unprecedented to us, right? We know it happened before historically, but nobody had been through this before. We didn't have a manual on how to do this. And like, mm-hmm. I just, I want to encourage school staff and leadership um, in that like, yeah, dismantling normal and rebuilding a new normal is a lot of hard work and it is kind of scary. It does require courage and commitment and like diligence. But the whole last school year, right, 20 to 21, you did it. You did the heavy lift and you did reinvent a new normal. So, like, just because we're going back in the building doesn't mean we have to pick up where we left off. So, I can, yeah. Look, taking a note from history, looking at 1918, looking at some of those things, and looking at some of the developments that came out of this stuff. Like, we had, we looked at the flu back in 1918 and, and back in that era. A lot of the rules nationally around um, around health care, around sick days, a lot of that shifted because of the pandemic they just went through. You know, history responds to that. When you look at the history of, uh, once again, that, that 1918 leading into 19, that, that lasted, <clears throat> just for example, that, that flu epidemic, which uh, right now I think we just matched the number recently, the number of people that died from it. But that flu epidemic, People were wearing, we look at the pictures back then, they looked like us. They look just like we look now. And then that lasted four years back then. It's, it's interesting, historians say, because it was so traumatic to America, we don't study it. Because it was just, we wanted to forget it. So we didn't learn a lot of stuff we want to forget. Which is why anybody who's a student of history, when you begin to look at early 20s, and now you have the roaring 20s, and the sock cops, and the dancing. Yeah, because people in the house for years. So now they're jumping around, which also led to some financial uh, insecurity because now they, people are spending and going crazy, which then led to the depression. So a lot of this stuff is just if you study history, this, as horrible as this is, it's happened before. Historically, we go back to smallpox, the, the whole fight we're having now over um, vaccinations. We've had this fight for years. You can trace back right now to um, George Washington's presidency, and they had this debate on vaccinations mm-hmm. because of there was, it, was a, it was a small box outbreak. Mm-hmm. And then you were like, I'm not taking that. Or the, 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 and George Washington was like, like, you're a soldier, you have to take it. Mm-hmm. It was the same fight, mm-hmm. but not accelerating. And that's the other thing with everything we're dealing with now. We have to understand historically, everything we're dealing with now is hyper, you know, everything's hypersensitive 
because of social media, because of television and all that. You know, back then, if something happened in, in Detroit, we didn't hear about it. So you read the paper. Now you hear about it. You know, a cat falls out of a tree in Detroit. It's a story in New York. Why is that? Right, right. Because it sells, you know, it sells commercials. Right, which, you know, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, which like young people are definitely walking into our doors um, of our homes as well as the school building with so much more information. And as you mentioned with Tulsa, not necessarily accurate information or a full frontal angle of what really, you know, occurred. So before we get off of kind of schools and moving a little bit into the sidewalk and the home, just a little Mm -hmm. bit, so that we are um, kind of talking to parents, mentors, and social service providers. But before we leave the schools, systems, right? Because you are not just a micro level boots on the ground. Like you are, you know, you're familiar with systems. So what should school leaders kind of be look like talk to us about the macro level systems in schools especially when it comes to dismantling normal and rebuilding a new one part of dismantling is preparing yourself to dismantle which means you got to train people that can handle it you got to train people that can handle the pivot you know you, you it's like a boat you turn it real quick it's gonna crack in half so what you got to do is you got to prepare people so i think now is the time to train people not train them specifically to be I'm going to deal, you're, you're trained now to deal with uh, COVID. You're trained, no. There's some people need to be trained. You're, you're the person, person that's going to help turn this, that's going to help to steer the system as we make turns. Like one thing I'm trying to do with the organization now is I want the organization to be agile enough that when something else like this happens, we're prepared to move to it. And I think that's one of the things that schools all over the country are looking at now. They've got to now prepare themselves that this is a possibility, that we may have to shut it down again. This might happen. We need to meet, we, we need to look at uh, vaccinations and all that. What's, What's that, that look like? Because now you've got to be prepared. And I think they've done a lot of that work. So yeah, a lot of that stuff has to be prepared. But at the same time, with young people, <clears throat> looking at how we can engage them more to be a part of their own solution, right? So they look at, when they go back home, what are our systems that are reconnected that we know we can reach? You know, one thing we're looking at, we look at it when we create our app and stuff like that. We want to be able to reach out to them no matter where they are. And maybe sometimes that outreach is just simply a text that says, are you good? You have food in the house? Everything's good? Yeah, we're good over here. Okay, we're just checking in on you. If you need anything, get me back. Now, we do that in on mass. So let's say if we match eventually every young person in the city, you know, that's one of my dreams, with a mentor using uh, some of the apps and stuff that we want to use, then we can kind of say, listen to all our mentors, listen. You know, we got a blackout this week. So, you know, blackout right now, we're going to be, people, electricity is going to be off for the next hour and a half. Everybody right now, reach out to your mentee, check on, see what's going on, you know. And then that move beyond the uh, the basic stuff is also just like a, a higher level move. When young people feel like they're checked on on mass like that, you're meant to reach out to you. Yeah, mine got me too. Y'all got, you got one too? Y'all got one? Wow, maybe something shifted here. Then they walk back in that building, you know, two weeks later, maybe there was an out, outage or something, or maybe another shutdown. They walk back in that school and they see Mr. Brown. And Mr. Brown, I don't text you sent me. That was hot. I thank you for that. So what's that do now? If that happens, if that happens in the building, not just one, not just two, 500, 600 deep, what feelings did you, what energy did you just bring into the building? Mm-hmm. Now the bill is like, yo, I like this. They're looking out for me. They checked on me. That's big. Right. As opposed to the same energy, if you got 500 kids walk back in the building and say, I've been out this building for six months and nobody ever reached out to me. What energy is that bringing to the building? Okay. That's, what I, that's what I look at from schools is that we now look at systems that are agile enough to kind of help us when we run into situations like this. Because now we know it's a possibility. Like, one thing we looked at recently, but there's all, you know, we have people who do plans and projections and, you know, uh, politicians and and, um, and and economists and all that. And what's quietly not been said was that all of y'all were wrong. Everybody was wrong. But now you jump back on TV. I got a program. We're going to right now, we can do the projections for next year. Bro, excuse me. Weren't you wrong? Are we not going to talk about the fact you were wrong? We're just going to start, we're just going to start accepting you again. That's, That's like, like a, the, the weather tell you it's going to be sunny and it's a snowstorm 
and he comes back on TV the next day. Well, the weather tomorrow, oh, stop. You were wrong the other day. Can we acknowledge that? Mm-hmm. No. which go which kids, yes kids and like exactly exactly that that there's and that there's a certain atonement that needs to happen because if if it's been uh you were wrong about that and mm, you didn't talk to me for six months and mm, but now you're cheering my way in the front door but you didn't hit my phone for six months right and i'm talking about present day right that's yeah. just i'm just i'm just talking i don't mean no harm to anybody but i'm just saying like to your point in this whole conversation like the mixed messages and saying one thing doing another like young people pay attention and and if you ask them they'll let you know how they're receiving what you're doing so i just that atonement piece we we have some atonement to probably make up for the last year and a half so maybe if I, yeah, maybe yeah. that first move is when you see them yo my bad i didn't reach out start to with an see. apology what thomas I should, I should have reached, reached out, out to you. I should have, I should have, I should have wrote, you know, I know we couldn't go outside, but I could have hit you on your phone. I could have done something. I apologize. Yeah. And I don't I think happen. that's happening on a large scale. Right. So, that's, so that's to the system. macro level systems piece, that atonement and straight apology and then restoration, like making amends. Yeah. Right. Making amends and 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 repairing. But if we don't even know on day one or day five that anything broke, then we're really disconnected because now you don't even know the young people in front of you are feeling like they don't trust you, like you didn't care the last year and a half disconnected. They've seen death. They've seen domestic violence, like what they're walking in with after being at home the last year and a half. Like we need to be connected and lean in. So what's going and on with them? The two sides of the coin. Number one, like you said, what they're bringing back to the building. Yes. And then the challenge that educators have, you know, I just pray for them and try to lean in and try to help them. So if you run a high school right now, basically half of your building hasn't been in the building before. Correct. What kind of nightmare is that culture? That yeah. half of the building has never, because that's one thing high schools are really big. You develop a culture. Yes. And yeah, certain words and, and chants and all the stuff we use in high schools. <clears throat> now you come back in that last class, they were gone for almost a year. And this new class has never been there. You got a half a year building. Oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a monster. That's a monster thing to handle. Absolutely. How do you create a culture when you don't haven't seen them before? Right. And so is it is it okay? And I kind of know your answer, but I'm saying it out loud. Like, is it okay that a part of the a part of the amends and the the real talk that when you first encounter young people, like is the apology if that's necessary, right? But also the I don't know how yeah. to rebuild normal, but I know you're not feeling what it was. And this culture, this high school culture, like I know yeah. what you want from it and we're like working on it, but what do you think we need to do? Cause, cause I don't know. And it's okay for us to admit what we don't know. Is that a part of the restorative the process? The apology, the, uh, the, the check-in, which is always, how are you? Are you good? What happened? And then, then you might get, you know, I lost an uncle, I lost this person, I lost that person, my mother had it, but I'm, all that stuff comes out. Mm-hmm. And then the last piece is you said, okay, so how do we build this together going forward? What is what things do you need me to do as a teacher, as a principal, as an as a, as a organization head? What do you need us to do? And sometimes, like I said earlier in the conversation, sometimes what they need separately is what, for us to put them in a good light and to take care of them. And to make sure they're fed and make sure they're comfortable and they're safe. Mm-hmm. And the growth, you know, they're handling the growth on their own. Mm-hmm. But sometimes we have to just, you know, we have to put them in safe in the safe space and protect them. Mm-hmm. You know, and they feel <clears throat> once again, I, I stay with kids, man. Um, and I told I, I've always tell people my son taught me that when he was four. And to this day, I, it's just a mess. I, anybody knows he's heard this. But coming, coming through a crazy rainstorm, I'm driving, I can't see anything in front of me. My son's in the back seat in a, in a car seat playing a video game. I'm scared. I think I'm going to pull a car over. I don't want to, you know, get the accident. I'm shook because, you know, the rain is coming down in sheets. He in the back seat. Just, he look up every once in a while and just play his game. And we finally got home and I got her in the house. <clears throat> it took me a minute to process it. 
but the, the reason, reason he didn't, didn't panic, panic because, because of his level of trust in me. So if I'd have been a flaky individual, individual then, of then of course, course he probably would have put the game down and been scared. scared. But he's, he's like, there's, there's no, no way in the world, world this tool is going to let something happen, happen to me. So therefore, they probably didn't even process, process that. that. But, but that's, that's what allowed him to sit back there and say, I'm just going to play my game. I know daddy ain't going to mess it up. You know, and when young people can feel like that about adults around them, that allows them to be kids. They have permission again to be kids. That, you know, the meal's going to be there. The house is going to be there. You know, the heat's going to be on. This is the kind of stuff talk we need to reevaluate ourselves in terms of what message and what, uh, how do our kids feel about us in the, in the job that we're doing? Because that, that's how, when they walk in the building, that's the energy they walk into the building with as we prepare them for school and everything else they do. So right. But then it's a, major, it's a major opportunity for us to reexamine ourselves and what we're doing and what we're not doing. Right. And that's all of us. That's not, I got, I got stuff, stuff I'm looking at for myself. myself. Like, yeah, you got to stop doing that. Right, right. Or you need to start doing this. Right, right. So and I mean, that part, you can't be excited because there's so much death. And, but if you, had to, if you ever could parse it down like that, yeah. It's also a time to be excited about recreating a world that's more responsive to people and, and shows love. Like when that young man, you and I said, when that young man, young family died in, in um. New York, they were in the basement when they had the flood. And everyone, it was a big flood, and they flooded the basement apartment. And everybody said, you know, well, global warming is bad, that water is rough. But maybe our response was being, why was that family living in the basement? Maybe that's something we need to look at. Why is the family, you know, have to hobble down in the illegal basement somewhere where water can get in because there's no access, there's no, there's no doors to get out. But we're worried about the water. Asking the wrong questions, Asking the wrong right? Questions. Assigning the wrong answers to the wrong questions, <laughs> um, not having the conversations that need to be had, um, yeah. and are some of these conversations uncomfortable? Sure, because yeah. it does require to go inward. It does require to um, an ego check, right? Um, yeah. yeah, okay, you've been doing something for twenty years, and turns out that wasn't that like socially emotionally appropriate so yeah. let's stop tomorrow <laughs> you know like well, today yeah, but you that's like, like, like you're there's some things that have been like your signature yeah and you realize, and you realize I, can't, I can't and it was toxic the whole that. time <laughs> why would you do that no that's well, right. I thought that was nah, I never do that again yeah and you gotta say well, well okay <laughs> you know yeah. and yeah. humble yourself and say wow I was wrong yeah yeah and yeah. kids are the first ones you know, they, they, something we say, you know, when I was your age, you were never their age. Correct. Correct. So their that. age in this time, right? So, yeah. And you, so you mentioned just a lot of um, pieces for the, like the parents, mentors and social service mm -hmm. workers, just because from the sidewalk to the schools. But what yeah. I hear you saying in regards to the, the um, story about your son is like, for those who are on the sidewalk, those who are in these agencies, social service agencies, people in the community or in the homes, it is yeah. about being a trustworthy adult, right? To put our ego to the side when building systems within social service um, agencies yeah. and to be able to, you know, do the inner work as well, but to be a trustworthy adult, to follow through on our word, right? To provide, Easy. to protect, Easy, to tell the truth, What? Right? That's the easiest and the hardest thing in the world to do. Mm -hmm. You know, old folks used to say, show up. Mm -hmm. Just show up. Mm -hmm. You know, and show up. You said you're going to be there at 10 o'clock, be there at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. You said you're going to call them every Thursday at 3 o'clock, call them every Thursday at 3 o'clock. I always tell people the first two or three times probably won't mean nothing. Mm -hmm. But every time you do it, every time you do it again, that's the time they get it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's slow and that once taught me. And, I know all my stories are real. Like, like this, kids will show you when you show up for them, it blows them away because they've been they've been hurt so many times with people not showing up. You know, I had a young man challenge me, sixth grader. I said, Listen, you gotta get to school on time. I'm gonna talk to your mother. Well, my mother works at an overnight shift at such and such. You never gonna talk to her because she'll get in. So nobody can talk to my mother. I said, What time your mother get in? She gets in like five in the morning and she's up to make me breakfast and she goes to sleep and she goes back to work. 
So nothing you can do about it. I looked at him, okay, I'm fine. I'm good. Next morning, young man got up. He wiping his eyes and walking out of his bedroom. I'm sitting at the table eating breakfast with his mother. <laughs> Yo, that's so. I met your mother. She real cool, baby. You better hurry. This baby about to be gone, bro. Oh, he's what? But and when we got and that, the mother told him, Mr. Owens said he's gonna take you to school. So we sat around, we talked while he got dressed and everything, and I drove him to school. I could never get rid of that kid. Right. That was you know, and I and, and I know every teacher, every educator in the building can tell you stories like. Mm-hmm. Now, when you show up for them, really, really show up, then they ask and they're like, okay, you, you got you got your approval. I'll give you the card. Right. You're good. Absolutely. And then you, now you got to now you got to cradle and, and hold that confidence with your love mm-hmm. that you never want to let them down. And if you do let them down, because we do let people down, apologize. Like you said earlier, reconcile, mm-hmm. atone. Mm-hmm. Don't just you know, don't hurt them. Then just say, well. Oh, everybody hurt you now. No. Or I did that because you, da, 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 as you I said at the beginning you. of the conversation. I didn't show up. I didn't right. Show up one time. Right. Mm. Shifting the blame. Yeah, Absolutely. So, in our, as we kind of wrap this up, out of this whole conversation, I heard a lot of like calls to action. But yeah. if you were to, you know, sum it up in three just mean calls to action, marching orders. We need to do this, this, and this um, when supporting our children in the new normal, whether that's in schools or the sidewalk, just in general. What are our three main marching orders? One of them, I'm going to tie right into what, where we are as, as, a, as a world. When it comes to your love, your consistency, your, your personality around young people, get the upgrade. <laughs> that's as I can say, download the upgrade. Anything we're doing, do better. Love harder, do more of that. So right away, I would say, have you upgraded? You know, we look at computers, download the upgrade. The second thing is, if you've got some young people in your life that you need to atone with, atone with them. Go meet them. Buy them lunch. I'm sorry. If that means that if it's a group of kids, if it's a whole school, if it's a church group, whatever, you know, I could do better. And I need you to help me do better. So atone, reconnect with those young people and do that. And then the last one I think is reconnect with who you are as an individual for yourself. You know, to really, because at the end of the day, the only thing you bring into a room is you. So if you've not worked on that, you can't affect that room. You need to make sure that you're the very best, um, the very best that you can be in that situation. So I ask people a lot. A lot of times we're just so busy running that we don't take the time to look at our own spiritual, our own emotional health. So I would challenge everybody. And I think, let me let me add that our own physical, our own emotion, and our own physical health. You know, for, for the brothers out there and for the sisters, you know, go to the doctor, get it checked out. You know, stress manifests itself in a lot of ways, and a lot of people outside of what you see with COVID, we we talk about. Um, preconditions and all that kind of stuff. That's a lot of stuff that we looked at when, when, when COVID hit our community. One was because it was COVID, but also the other one was because we were so vulnerable as a community, physically. Mm-hmm. With mm-hmm. the diabetes and high blood pressure and all the stuff that we deal with, we were vulnerable. Mm-hmm. So the vulnerable will go first. That's what it does. Mm-hmm. So, so three things for me is once again, get the upgrade, reconnect with young people, apologize in the tone, with the young people in your life, and then get yourself checked. Make sure that you're equipped, you know, for the battle that's ahead. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we need you all to be courageous, courageous warriors. You know, one thing we talk about all the time is um, some people in boxes talk about it. Some people are what we call convenient warriors. They fight the fights that most that best match them. But we have to be the kind of people that we're not convenient warriors. We fight all comers. So anybody, anybody that comes come through, through puts you, I'm ready to go. That's, that's the champ. The champ. Champs yeah. fight every every person come every challenge, every curse that comes at you, you fight. Convenient warriors just fight the battles they think they can win. Don't be that. Mm. Mm. So those those are four for you. Mm. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I so appreciate your time. We do. The last kind of question is how um, can folks support your work, get connected to your work, give us where we can find you, but also like how can the audience support your work? I would tell tell people, people check check us out out at newarkmentoring.org. It's newarkmentoring.org. We're also on um, social social media, media, Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Twitter, at Mentor Mentor Newark. Mentor Mentor Newark. Newark. We're going to be doing a lot of work in the community, working with a lot of the high schools, schools, working in partnership with the district, district, doing some incredible work with the district, district, and with a lot of the local mentoring organizations. So we're about to be really shifting the playing field of what mentoring looks like particularly at this time. So I'm, once again, going back to what I said earlier, I'm looking at the way we can be the most agile and serve the most people, you know, and that's that's what I want to do, you know. As we said, when in doubt, love the people, that's what we're looking to do. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Good job to me there. Yes. Well, thank this you. This is music in your life, people. <laughs> we need music. That's, that's good. That's a good uh, marching order, too. Absolutely. Yeah. So I thank you um, for your time. I thank you for the marinated wisdom. Um, and, you know, as I tell tell my guests, like sometimes, um, you know, and we don't always need accolades or flowers or whatever, but um, I super, super respect and honor all of my guests. I don't have anyone on here. I take this spot very seriously. And so, um, yeah, no, the, the real talk that you have in your mouth and, and the power that you bring to, to the conversations that are not being had um, are important. And so, as we said at the very beginning of the conversation, sometimes people are seeing the truth but not speaking on it. And so just keep doing that work, Mr. Thomas Owens. Um, It is, it is absolutely essential. Like your voice is needed in this season. And so we appreciate that. You give it and people who know, know, they don't know where this comes from. I told kids, it's a, it's a, it's a a great philosopher. When I tell people stay far from timid, only make moves when your heart's in it. And remember, Mm -hmm. sky's the limit. Hey, (laughs) People that know, no. Okay. <laughs> People that know, no. Thank yeah. you so much, Thomas. And uh, we'll you. talk soon. Have a very good yeah. night. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Well, family, well, family, well, family. We, <sighs> these interviews are, you know, as we embark on season two, um, The conversations that we're having are super, super necessary, super necessary. And that conversation, there's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of nuances in some of these topics that we're discussing. But that conversation with Mr. Thomas Owens, executive director of Mentor Nork, told us, right, to, he said, upgrade which is you, if you've been doing the same thing your whole career of working with young people, it's time to accept the upgrade prompt. (laughs) Don't keep ignoring it. Upgrade, upgrade, because there may have been things that we've been doing a long time that were actually not appropriate, right? Or they stopped being appropriate 10 years ago, even if you started at 20, right? We need to upgrade family. We need to upgrade. Number two is to atone. If we were, we were carrying a lot the last year and a half, especially school staff. But as these young people come back into our doors through our buildings, there may need to be some amends and some restoration that needs to take place. Um, with our young people. That also does require asking them how they are feeling, what they are walking through the door with, because as a social worker, right, mental health on both sides, adults and um, our youth, there's a lot of mental health going on right now. So sometimes that atonement is all that they were really um, asking for, right? Um, And number three, he said to go within, which he talked a lot about throughout the conversation, because that's kind of the most uncomfortable part. And going within, by the way, is what makes action number one and two possible. Because if you never go within, then you don't know that you're supposed to atone and you don't know that you need to upgrade. So that going within piece is essential. We have to look at our own mental health. We need to physically be good. We need to be getting enough sleep and eating healthy and doing what we need to do because to carry our next generation, um, you know, there's a lot of, 
introspective reflection that needs to happen so that we are carrying our young people in the way they deserve to be carried. We need to be consistent. We need to be trustworthy. They need to be able to trust that we are actually looking to keep them safe, that we don't know everything. right? That they are the experts in their own development, that they should be at the table, the planning tables at the, at these schools to be able to reintegrate and rebuild culture and dismantle normal. I feel like that was the biggest part of this conversation is to dismantle normal family. Adults are walking in the building saying, I can't wait to get back to normal. And young people are saying, I don't want to go back to normal. I want a new normal. And that's the kind of the biggest piece I believe that Thomas has stood on before this Sidewalk Talk episode. But to get him on here to talk about that is super, super key. So please do support Thomas Owens as well as um, Mentor Norik, which is a mighty, mighty organization that is doing powerful, unprecedented, revolutionary work here in Newark, New Jersey. As usual, we are trailblazers around here. If you don't know what we're doing around here, I don't. you need to go find out because Nork is leading the way in so many movements and Mentor Nork is one of them. So we appreciate um, your support on tonight. Again, my name is Aaliyah Berry. You can find me at Seeds and Berries on Facebook as well as Instagram, Aaliyah Berry on LinkedIn. And you can find this episode on our YouTube channel. You can also visit me on my website at seedsandberries.com. Again, I do program development training and direct clinical services in schools, nonprofits, and the government sector. I think a real quick shameless plug is we are doing mental health support groups for school staff. I kind of have to mention that, right? Because if your school, if you are a school leader and you think that your school staff needs mental health support and peer-to-peer support, then Seeds and Berries is offering a program called the Support Spa um, and contact me so that we can get it started. Um, We've done it with several school districts and it did prove to be effective. So that's a shameless plug, but it may be necessary for you and your staff. So again, like, tag, and share this particular episode, and we are going to see you next time. The question is, when is next time? Next time is October 10th, right? So Thomas Owens, Mentor Nork, he's an expert, obviously, in mentoring, but we're going to drill down into the topic of mentoring because through this season, if every young person in this city had a mentor, then we would, you know, thrive that much more. And so I believe in mentoring very much. Um, And so next month, in the month of October, we're going to dive deeper. But we had to start here, right, and then dive deeper into mentoring. So my next guest is a dynamic 24 hours a day, seven days a week guest who um, we're going to talk to him about mentoring young men. Um, And then later in October, we're going to talk about uh, mentoring young women and cross, but that those are what those episodes are going to um, focus on. So again, at Sidewalk Talk, um, pick a lane. We always talk about pick a lane, pick a lane, pick up a piece of work um, so that we can, we can move forward um, in the community as a village. Thank you for tuning in on tonight. We appreciate your support. Have a good night.